What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Tina Butterwolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh-huh. Rebel Radio is going down. Would you say Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome back to Rebel Radio. We got big things popping at Rebel Radio this month. I know you heard us. Uh, at South by Southwest, live on stage with Catherine Burns from The Moth recently, as well as uh, John Levy, which we caught up with at South by. And next, we're off to Coachella. We'll be podcasting live from the Coachella Media Tent, bringing you some special interviews from uh, participating artists. More to come on that. But this week, we're in studio with Karam Gill. He's the director of G Funk, a documentary about uh, Warren G and West Coast Gangsta Rap. Uh, Looks like it's going to be an exciting movie. I haven't seen it yet, but I know they they were blowing up at South By. And uh, he's got some really interesting things to say about his process of making his first feature documentary. Um, Karam's a young director. He's been coming up through the music video circuit, uh, making videos for folks like Marshmello and Borgor. And he's going to kind of give us some insight into his process, how he got this job as a young dude who didn't live through the G-Funk era or experience any of that personally, but he says the key to his success has just been preparation that he went in knowing more about it than anybody else they'd talked to and, and won the job that way. So really good lessons coming up from Karam Gill about G-Funk. And right now, let's get into the interview with Karam Gill. So, dude, thanks for doing this, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Sure. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the high from South by Southwest and, and everything else you're doing. Uh, but take us back. I want. I, I will kind of. I'm interested to know how you became the guy that's making this G Funk documentary. Um, so, have you always been into music? Uh, yeah, my, that- my parents always. Uh, <clears throat> my parents always used to play a lot of like '70s, like Dorian right? Fire. You know, like. Isley Brothers, all that type of stuff growing up. Um, Do you remember the first record that you bought? The first the first record I bought was uh, in 1999-2001 by Dre. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> My mom bought it for me, and then they put it on, and they were like, wow, I don't know if we should have got this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, man, so that, that was probably the first one. Yeah. And so you were you were hooked on hip-hop from the beginning? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so, um, yeah, I've just, I just kind of grew up on that music. Yeah. Um, and that kind of got me into, like, you know, the Warren G, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre era. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kinda... So I know now you have, I've seen a bunch of your music videos, mm-hmm. some of your brand stuff, and it looks like you have a great portfolio coming together. It's coming together slowly. <laughs> what was the first, do you remember the first music video that, like, really impacted you? Man, uh, damn, I don't, <laughs> no, uh, that's okay. I don't know, man. I, I just, I kind of just like started watching music videos and then, yeah. and then, uh, you know, actually it's kind of such a weird, such a weird video. I had a neighbor and it was the right there video by Chingy. And oh, for shit. some reason, like, like that might've been like the first video I watched. <laughs> it wasn't like profoundly creative, but I was just like, oh, I didn't know music video ex- existed and. That's funny. That might have been one of the first ones. And then, so how did how did you start making video? Was that like at what point did you know that that you wanted to do that? Um, I've always like been you know shooting photos and whatnot. Okay. The full story is actually I used to play college soccer and I uh, tore my ACL, mm. <clears throat> and I kind of took a big break from like you know creative stuff to play soccer. I was trying to go semi pro and you know do something there. Oh wow! And uh, tore my ACL. I had reconstructed knee surgery um, in college two and a half years in, and then. I, uh, my buddy was like, look, dude, like you got to, you know, get back to doing something productive or else you're just going to sit around all day. Yeah. Um, so he's like, come shoot my show. And then I went to go shoot his show. I ran to Warren backstage. I was like, can I shoot your show? Cause, cause he was opening up for Warren. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I was your friend. Oh, just kid Rob. He's like, a just like a low, smaller, like a uh, um, artist that's coming up right now. Okay. Um, he's pretty talented. Yeah. And, uh, he, uh, he's like, yeah, I'm opening up for Warren G if you want to come through. So I was like, all right. <laughs> So me and my buddy went, <clears throat> we shot Warren's show and ran into Warren, and then that led to me starting to do all of his media, creative direction and stuff oh, like nice. that. And, uh, you know, here's actually the first video that I did. Yeah. Um, 
So that's kind of how it started. That's the, uh, what, what was the video? Uh, from my house? Yeah, yeah. It was okay. me and a couple of my buddies just kind of collaborate on that. With beats nice. And, yeah. Yeah. So how would you know, like, you meet Warren G and, like, what gives you the confidence to say, I can do your creative and, <laughs> like, where, where does that come from? Warren's just such a cool guy. Warren, yeah. like, came up to us and he's like, what do you, because we were just backstage. like, what do you guys do? Because we had cameras around yeah. there. And we're like, oh, we, uh, you know, we shoot photos, videos. And we, we, what are we going to say? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. We just mess around. Sure. And he was like, well, you guys, like, started talking to us. And I was like, well, can we shoot your show? And he said, yeah. So he brought us on stage with him. And yeah. we cut it up. Next day, we were at Jimmy Kimmel with him. And from there on out, we were just, like, doing all his media. Nice. And so were you thinking that this is a career at that point? Or what were you thinking? Um, at that point, <clears throat> it was just, like, you know, I'm in college, like, 20 years old, 21 years old. I just thought it was cool. Yeah. <laughs> All my friends were like, what? You're touring with Warren G? Right. Like, you're at Snoop Dogg shows? Like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. I was like, I don't know, man. It's just... <laughs> it wasn't until about six months in that I realized that, you know, <clears throat> this is something that I really want to do, mm-hmm. like, full time. Mm-hmm. And then I stopped rehabbing my knee and stopped soccer. So did you think you were going pro soccer before that? Or you N- not like pro pro like yeah. semi pro like, yeah you know just dabble in like a couple years after college yeah um i was never like a professional professional okay um yeah yeah so um <clears throat> and how much did you know you know of the the warren story and the whole you know g-funk like sound like you were into that music but you you must have been pretty young when you discovered all that mm-hmm. so like how much were you familiar with like the all the history and the culture and all that? Mm-hmm. Um, I was born after Regulate came out, so <laughs> ninety four. So uh, right. Um, it also, I mean, I'm, I figured it all out when I was on the road with Warren because we would just, you know, be with huge artists and they would just be talking about crazy things like right Talk next about to the old days. Oh, me and Tupac did this, and me and yeah. this happened. Me and Biggie went to you know Bed Stuy did this, or whatever. You know, and after a while, I was like, dude, like you have the most incredible story. Like a true like hero's journey, it's yeah. like, you know, a scripted thing. Mm-hmm. And so we started writing down. He's like, I've been wanting to do this for years. Nice. And so I was like, well, damn, let's do it. That's cool. Um, and then I know you've done a bunch of other music videos, Borgor and Marshmallow, and saw a bunch of your stuff. So where did that, how'd that happen? Um, you know, shortly after working with Warren, you know, once you kind of work with someone in the industry, other people kind of, you're like validated, if you will. Yeah. Um, and my buddy Daniel, um, his cousin's Mo Shalizi, uh Marshmallow's okay. manager. Yeah. And uh, so that's how, you know, we started working with Marshmallow and doing all his stuff. Um, and then, you know, the other stuff kind of just came. People just kind of hit me up, hit mm-hmm. our company up. Um, yeah. So what do, you, what do you think, like, uh, you know, when you start getting into that with, with different artists, like, there's so many directors out there, right? And and uh, so, what do you feel like you bring that's different, or 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 maybe how do you like articulate the your unique perspective? Um, I think that you know, being younger, um, I'm 22, so it kind of a lot of labels and and artists and things like that. When they work with someone like myself, you get someone who understands how to connect with that younger demographic and mm-hmm. that digital demographic. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is I think I have a, 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 one of my strengths is just being able to, like, understand what, you know, the kid who sits in the back of the class is going to want to see and what's going to connect with him emotionally, but also the guy who's the quarterback of the football team mm. and be able to kind of create content that appeals to all types of kids um, as well as adults, but stuff that's universal. So why do you think you're able to do that? I don't know, man. I think, you know, I've experienced a lot of different things. I think um, I've traveled quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents always introduced me to different things. I've, I've always made an effort to try to get to know all people. Um, whether, you know, like especially in L.A. high school, it's like the clickiest thing in the world. But you know, right? if, you, if you step out of that and you try to meet everyone, yeah. you understand their perspectives. And that then, you know, consequently helps you understand the world better, I think. Yeah. So. That's interesting. Um. So so, tell us about the film. What's uh? <laughs> what's the? So so 
sorry. So it's Warren's story, right? How much, um, how much do you think is like personal versus the, just broader, like what was happening in music and G funk and, and all that? Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so it's the, it's the G funk story, um, mm -hmm. with Warren G being, you know, the backbone and, you know, protagonist, if you will. Cool. Um, and it's his story. Yeah. Um, it's basically how, you know, G-Funk, big picture, how G-Funk commercialized hip-hop music, how it transformed hip-hop from gangster rap that, you know, was urban and, you know, it's very select to mm -hmm. music that became pop and white America started purchasing hip-hop albums. You know, Snoop's album was the first album in history of, in the history of music to debut at number one, mm -hmm. first debut album at number one on the Billboard charts. Mm -hmm. Um, Dre and Warren, also extremely commercial. Sure. Talks about that, and then that's kind of like the back the backstory of of the rise of G Funk, and then you have Warren G, trials and tribulations that he overcame, in his path to success. Yeah, um, and being such an instrumental figure in connecting the dots with everyone. Um, so those two things together, I would say, shape the the framework of the documentary. What did you learn? That what what were the, what were the big surprises that you learned in that process? Um, preparation is 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 like insanely important i'm sure you know that as a, as a journalist but yeah. uh, um especially with this documentary we didn't want to have a narrator um we were in talks with some pretty you know big artists to narrate yeah. originally but yeah. we were like you know what g funk's a smooth sound it's a flowing sound we need a documentary that flows seamlessly so in order to have everyone complete each other's sentences and have this fluid story it's you know it took a year or two of just straight research and scripting interviews and mapping out these big six foot boards two of them of how the story flows wow um i don't think i'm ever going to take those apart these big cord boards yeah, I bet. I bet. <laughs> um so yeah just a lot of preparation man yeah what um how how is that how's that experience shaped your your perception of the the music obviously you said you weren't you didn't live through it right so it's funny i think um I mean, it sounds like you, you're the right choice hearing you talk about it, but you wouldn't necessarily be the obvious choice that if somebody told me there was a, a Warren G documentary or a G-Funk documentary, I probably wouldn't have guessed that it was you making it. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's what a lot of people were, were saying. At, yeah. At, uh, I mean, the producers, too, they, they, they th said the same thing, and they're like, I was like, if you guys you know, want to meet with me, you can. So they all flew in from Cleveland. Wait, so who, who produced the film? Um, our executive producer was Matt Carpenter, um, who's a, a really odd, like one of the most incredible dudes I've ever met out of Cleveland. Um, Bob Ruggieri, um, he did Take Shelter, King of the Summer, Cannes Film Festival, Sundance. Okay. Um, Gary uh, Uzdal uh -huh. and uh, Rafael Chavez, along with Warren G. And um, Gary came from Tyler Perry. Um, Rafael and him have a company together. And then Warren. Okay. Um, so they 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 didn't necessarily feel like you were the obvious choice. Well, no, they, I mean they didn't have anything against it. They were just like, all right, this is weird. Like this kid, you know, literally yeah. was born after the fact. Uh, right. Let's you know see what he's all about because they hired me when I was twenty twenty one. So how did you overcome that? I mean, they they all flew in <clears throat> to uh, one of the producers' houses. He has a big house <clears throat> in Tarzana, and. Uh, they just started grilling me on the on the project. They're like, "All right, we'll start talking about it." So I just went through it, and I had these big boards. And they started asking me, well, "What if this ha doesn't happen? What if we don't get that interview?" And I was like, "Oh, well, then we do this." And they were like, "And by the end of it, they're like, honestly, man, like I don't think anyone knows more about this than you do." Nice. And I was like, "Yeah, here's the two big boards. Yeah, do you have any more questions?" <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's ah, amazing. Yeah. How did that? Um How, so having gone through this now, how does that change your filmmaking, like from before this project to after? Um, it's given me not that I didn't have it before, but I think it's given me a little more confidence to uh -huh. to now seeing this come to fruition is just like, damn, like I didn't, you know what I mean? Like to have all these incredible artists and athletes and names behind yeah. this project. Um. I think it's just gonna open doors, and it's it's gonna you know it's give me the confidence to go out and really pitch anything I want, and whatever is on my mind and whatever I want to create. So, kind of empowering, I guess. Yeah, and what do you think you want to do as a filmmaker? Like, if you look back, or if you look 
the head. What do you think your contribution is to filmmaking? Um, just, you know, telling stories. I love, like, you know, underdog stories. Warren's an underdog story. Um, I love stuff like that. I love music projects. Um, I want to create things that are very commercial, but have a lot of um, undertones, whether it's political or, you know, thematic, like you need to overcome this, like giving you something to take away from it. Mm-hmm but using the commerciality of the project to reach a wide amount of people. So, like, this project, for instance, is I think it's very commercial. It's going to go and out in the world and do a lot of things. Sure. Within it, you know, there's a lot about the black-white police tension, the Rodney King, a lot of pe- things that people kind of... Now, with OJ and all that stuff that's come out, it's, it's out there, but right. a lot of the police stuff, this documentary addresses that head-on. It also addresses, you know, overcoming things and family and friendship and being able to do it through a commercial project allows you to reach a lot of people mm-hmm. and get your message out there. So I think that's kind of my, what I want to do as a filmmaker. That's great. So o- other than convincing the producers, were there obstacles that you had overcome in the, in the process? Um, or was it all smooth? <laughs> no, I mean, it was, uh, it was a lot of creative um, roadblocks um, that you had to just, you know, if you couldn't get an interview or you couldn't, do something like okay how do you fill that hole mm-hmm. um you know it was just yeah mo- mostly just little creative things that came up but that's like anything yeah yeah so is that easy for you then to be like kind of nimble and just jump to the next or or is there anything that's like you know is there any point where you start to question like am i making the right choices um <clears throat> you always question everything you do um but you got to have a, a vision and be strong willed. Mm-hmm. And as a director, you know, you can't, you know, constantly be second guessing. But, you know, thankfully I had, you know, two incredible editors and one in Los Angeles that was incredible, Andrew Primavera. And he, uh, he was, you know, the best soundboard and, and, you know, helped with so many, creating so many ideas and, you know, ways to do things that you mm-hmm. just bounce things off of him. And, you know, I'd ask him, like, all right, man, what do you think about this? And he'd hit me with the pros, cons. Like, I'm like, damn, like, there you go. You laid it out. Like, right. you know, so That's I think having a good editor really gets you around that. Yeah. What about, so I know you talked to so many interesting people, I'm sure. Um, what's the best thing that's not, that didn't make it in the, in the final cut? Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to have to save that for all the rollout stuff we're doing. But, uh. I think um, there are some hilarious, hilarious, hilarious Snoop quotes that oh, he yeah. said just about how he views um, just today's world. That are, it's, they're just so they're going to come out like as like teasers sure. for yeah. like, when we you know before it hits theaters and everything. Yeah, but um, man, he had some hilarious things that he said off like I'm on sure. camera, but just not in the context of the film. Right, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. What about, um, you know, obviously, like, there was a lot of controversy at the time. Um, At the time, all this was happening, right, between East Coast, West Coast. You know, as I mentioned, I was, I was, uh, I had front row seats to that with with West Side Connection. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, Biggie and Tupac and just beef. It was was a time of a lot of beef. Um, Is that still... is that still lingering? Like, are people hesitant at all to talk about that stuff? No, not at all. Oh. Um, it's actually funny, the documentary, every single person from Too Short to Snoop to Warren pretty much all said it was all the media that kind of created that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at the time, Warren was in, with, was with Biggie in, in New York during that whole time. And yeah. it wasn't really what it was made to be. It was It was kind of instigated and created. Sure. Um, you know, to sell, to sell media, and I mean, everyone agreed on that, for the most part. Yeah, I remember w- when I was with Dub C, we went to New York, and you know, it, we were a little, uh, I would just say concerned because not knowing, you know, what we're walking into, um, and we're walking down the street, and like some kids ran up on us, and we're just like, you know, appreciative. They were like just big fans of Dub C, in in the middle of New York City. And, you know, I think we all had that moment where we kind of realized that, that, like, fans don't care. They love, you know, they love music and they love this culture. And, and 
Um, you know, that's one particular, you know, there's a lot of motive. And I think that is, to, to your point about um, how that commercialized hip hop, you know, in general, I think that's totally true. And I think all the beef had a big part of that, right? That it, it wasn't simply just the music, but there was all this theater around it playing out in these larger than life characters. And I think that's a lot of what fueled just how big everything got. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, you know, I think it almost hurt it as well. I think, well, I think long term it did. Yeah. For sure. No, I think it, I think it hurt it a lot. I mean, the G Funk era essentially came to like a, not a halt, but, but, but it, it stopped a little bit. Yeah. You know, with the progression of G Funk spreading and just like the, you know, that sound spreading, it became a lot more gritty and intense and, you know, battle rappy and, yeah. and like East versus West diss tracks, this and that. Whereas like before that, you had, you know, the chronic doggy style regulate dog food all that stuff was very like just let's party and have a good time yeah you know yeah yeah i mean i think um you know i for, for my my experience of it was that uh really after biggie and tupac got killed like the industry whether it was the labels or the radio stations or the um the concert promoters like everyone just was like okay we're done now you know what I mean? Because cause it went from being hype and fun and just entertainment to, you know, this real thing. And, you know, you couldn't get insurance. You couldn't get, um, you, like, you couldn't get played on radio anymore because I think people just realized, like, they didn't, you know, they didn't want to take it that seriously. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the documentary doesn't go, it kind of cuts off at, after you know, sure. Source Awards and Suge Knight and did yeah. whatever he did and, and say that whole thing and it yeah. touches on Biggie and Tupac a little bit and then we literally just, you know, we kind of skip forward to today and Wiz Khalifa and Ty Dolla Sign and YG, all those guys and what they did. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying, definitely. Do you feel like music is still having that type of impact or that it or that it can or, or, or how do you feel like music's kind of place and culture has changed um i think you know music is always is going to be like the focus point of or at the center point of culture um but i guess regards to hip-hop specifically um it's changed in the way that technology is coming to play and you're and people everyone's able to create you know a great beat Mm-hmm. and a lot of them sound the same and a lot mm-hmm. of artists sound the same and a lot of you know whereas back then it's like you have to be original there's no other there's no s- two Snoop Dogs that sound the same there's right. no two Warren G's that sound the same and you can't you know what I mean whereas now it's like there's like four or five artists that if you put them on a track it would take me a second to figure out exactly who it is yeah and I think that's the biggest difference is the originality aspect of sure. innovating and you know but there's guys that are like Drake's album you know he's innovating that sounds like the whole Jamaican thing he's got going on like no one's really been doing that mm-hmm um so there is some of it but yeah i mean i think i think it's just that there's that much more music coming out Mm -hmm. yeah right that back then you know it took it was hard work to make a record it's not that it's not hard work now but like to get a studio to uh you know to find the beats to you know all of that just took a lot of time and uh you know records took months and years to make where now they take weeks in a lot of cases right and Mm -hmm. i don't know that that doesn't necessarily mean that they're worse but i think it just that means that there's that much more of it right so it's you know there's five guys that sound alike only because now there's room for five guys Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um so talk about south by i know we just got back from south by it sounded like you had some really successful premiere there was it was that the World premiere was it mm-hmm. first first time people seeing it? Yeah, that was that was a world premiere. Yeah, uh, then we had two other screenings. Um, man, it was it was incredible, um, <laughs> incredible yeah. experience. Nice. Yeah. So I want to talk about a couple things. Um, first of all, just like, what does that feel like for strangers to be seeing it for the first time and the response you got and what what's going on inside? Oh, dude, it's <laughs> it's crazy, man. I mean, you know it's just i don't even know like how to describe it like my my buddies they're all just like damn man like we've just been reading the reviews and like you know the press is coming out and yeah 
um, the first night, you know, we got a standing ovation, which was an incredible, incredible feeling to see, yeah. you know, years of work going into something and, and people liking it. Mm -hmm. What was going through your head before the movie started? I got to get the sound right. Yeah. <laughs> um, are you just, but like, are you just focused on those kind of details? Yeah. I, I, yeah. The thing is, I didn't even sit. Like, I just stood in the back for yeah. all the screenings. Yeah. I've seen it probably 100, 200 times. Of course. So I was just sitting there like, you know what? My friends are here. My family's here. There's a bunch of people in this theater. Yeah. Um, so are you able cool. to enjoy it? I know, like, you know, I've never made something like that. But anything that I've created, like, I see my focus is always on the flaws that I see. Mm -hmm. um, that sometimes other people don't see because they're just not paying the kind of attention that I'm paying. Is that Are you doing that or are you able to, like, enjoy the moment and kind of savor it? I'm able to enjoy the moments. Like, you know, DOC and Deion Sanders had some hilarious parts that people were cracking up at. So I, I, I love that stuff. But at the same time, this was a relatively finished project. There's like, it's definitely needs a new sound mix and there's some elements to it that it's a work in progress yeah. to, to a level. Um, so those things just killed me sitting there watching it. And like, I was like, damn, like, this shit should not be there. <laughs> you know, so. Sure. That was frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> But it was, yeah. other than that, it was cool. Not many people, probably no one noticed it other than me. Of course. Yeah, 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 for sure. So then externally, like, how does it change the game? You know, you uh, you wake up the next day or you come back from South By, you've had three great screenings and a bunch of great reviews and all that. Like, how does that change the game for you? Oh, man, I mean, um, like I was saying earlier, I think it opens up a lot of doors for me, you know. When people find out that, you know, this was, I was 20, 21, 22, 22 yeah. now. Yeah. Working on this, you know, people are, you know, they want to see what I'm working on next and they want to kind of talk to me. So it's cool. To, it helps me as a filmmaker career wise. It's, For sure. It's awesome. <clears throat> so, what's that process like? Um, how do you, how do you capitalize on that momentum, right? If you think about your own career, because, you know, I think for a project like this, um, again, I've never made a film, but my understanding, it's pretty all-consuming, right? You're just, you're, you know, you're head down trying to make this thing, right? And then you make it, and now you got to go out and, and bring it to the world and promote it and all that. And, and at the same time, like you said, it's going to create a, a lot of opportunity that people want to know what's next, right? That, um, and, and I think now is your, you have this window, hopefully it'll last a long time and be a huge window, but... But but you never know, right? How that how big that window is of opportunity to to g gain momentum for your career. So how do you how do you do that? Um, you just stay stay working. Don't get complacent. Um, you know. So are you already? Is there a next project already? Oh yeah, I got uh, yeah. two things in development right now. Um, nice. I can't really go too in depth on them right now. <laughs> okay. But uh. Music stuff? Music, music driven feature length projects. Nice. Um, scripted and documentary. Um, and then, you know, I'm kind of getting interest from a couple different people to work on a couple different things. Yeah. So, um, there's definitely stuff in the works. It's just, you know, picking that next project. Sure. The reason that this one I think worked out well for me and, and I kept my interest and I never got bored is because I'm fascinated with it. I don't ever want to do something that's not, I don't have my heart in 100% or I'm not passionate about it or I can't sit there all day long and enjoy it. Yeah. So I think it's about finding that next one that fulfills that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, as you said, like, you're going to have to watch this, whatever movie it is, you know, 100 plus times. Mm -hmm. if, if it's something you don't really care about, oh, yeah. that's going to be painful. <laughs> exactly, man. So that's kind of where I'm, my head's at. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, is it, are you, do you have mentors or are you figuring all this stuff out on your own? Uh, my dad was a filmmaker. Oh, okay. Um, documentary filmmaker. He did some stuff for BBC and ITV. My parents nice. are both from England. Yeah. Um, so he's helped me out, you know, just kind of guiding me a little bit. And then yeah. Warren, honestly, has been one of my mentors. Just kind of teaching me how to be a good person in the entertainment industry. And just, you know, watch out for this, watch out for that. Or, you know, just even just observing how he his demeanor is and how he acts. Yeah. Um, has been... A mentor of some sort. What is there a piece of advice that's been the most impactful for you? Yeah, just he's literally just like you know, stay true to those who help you out. And, yeah. Um, you know, mostly the stuff you learn from Warren is just observing Warren. 
um, you know, the whole no ego aspect of it. And, and, you know, like he's just, he's a cool dude. And yeah. You just see that. Yeah. How, um, I don't want to ask you to speak for him, but, but I'm curious what you observed, like, and, and, and not, not just him. Right. But, but a lot of guys like, you know, here at Warren had this, you know, massive hit, you know, international hit record, whatever. And then, you know, now I know he still does his thing and he has a cool fan base, but it's not at that level, right? And um, I'm curious, like, how people sort of adjust to that, right? Like, it's a matter of, like, shifting expectations that I think sometimes, um, you know, and, and again, these guys, all of them were super young when they're having this, like, astronomical level of success. And... I think it's human nature to just expect that to continue on this, you know, particular trajectory. And uh, so I'm curious what you observed about people that, you know, where that didn't happen, where they didn't, you know, continue to be household names, but, but yet they're still, you know, making, they're still creative, right? They're still making stuff that a lot of people care about. Um, I, I mean, uh, that's a tricky one. I don't know. You'd have to ask Warren. Um, but I mean, just from what I see, I mean, everywhere I go, everyone loves Warren G and yeah. I have a lot of respect for him. And he's still doing hit records. He had that hit, hit record a couple years ago for Neo, mm -hmm. um, Leave You Alone. And, you know, he's producing a bunch of stuff. You know, he's got a soundtrack coming out with the G Funk movie. That's nice. going to be huge. Cool. Um, so he's still doing a bunch of stuff. A lot of it's, you know, more production oriented, but he's, I mean, that'd yeah. probably be a question for Warren. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, I just think, you know, I mean, I know a lot of guys like that that are, that have what we would consider really good, successful careers, right? They get to do what they love and, and they get a lot of, you know, recognition for it. Um, but they're not like, you know, they're not Drake. Do you know what I mean? Where, where like everybody in the world like idolizes you and you know, not that everybody idolizes Drake either, but you know <laughs> what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's just an interesting uh, path to navigate. So, um, I know you do uh, some brand stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. What's what's is that? Um, what drives you to want to do to do video for brands? Um, I think it's you know it's pretty fun to. Uh, take a brand or a product within a brand, figure out who they're trying to sell it to and try to create effective content to sell it to them. And mm -hmm. it's, that just sounds like a really complicated version of saying marketing but sure. um, and advertising. But I think, you know, like I just got off the phone with Fujifilm just now, we were just kind of discussing, you know, how can we create like a worldwide, you know, docu-series you know, take this product around the world. And how can we integrate it into entertainment? Maybe do a deal with a record label to do music videos that are shot on. You know what I mean? Just like different ideas. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting, and in, in, to like be creative in that world. Um, you know, so it's just you know, it's just a different avenue. Yeah. Is there something given you know the the experience you have? Um, like, is there something you feel that you bring to brands that's different than than what they're getting? You know, like, is there a unique lens that you, you bring to a brand? Um, yeah, I think, you know, what I was kind of saying earlier with, like, the universal um, ability to, like, target younger people. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of brands are run by, you know, 40, 50-year-old dudes in suits. So, like, sure. you know, when I meet with them, um, they're kind of getting a fresher, newer perspective. Yeah. Um, what, do, what do you think the brands that you talk to, like, what do they need to learn about connecting with with young audiences? Um, you know, to I think being organic is one. Um creating content that people want to actually see. I was reading an article the other day or my buddy was telling me an article the other day about another um about um how narr like story driven content is like a million times more effective than um just stating like the facts or just selling the product. Like if you create a story, whether it's a fake story or whatever, around a sure. product, yeah, it, it just creates so much more buzz. Huh. And so I think that's one thing that is super effective. Yeah. 
developing stories that people can connect to and relate to. It's like, oh, I, I went through that. Mm-hmm. I relate to that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's a big one. So what about um, now that this, the project's done, you have to go out and market the film, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that's, I think, in some ways puts you in a very different role than, than being the creator. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you... I guess you know what's the plan, and and how do you um, how do you shift gears within yourself mm-hmm. to go into that marketing mode? Um, well, I mean, I, my creative agency that I that I founded with two of my buddies, Reed and Daniel, we're um, helping out the producers and and uh, the film with just the marketing content side of it. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull a bunch of like the uh, the stuff that wasn't on camera that was amazing. Like Ice T had some amazing moments and. Nice. There's just some hilarious stuff. We're gonna put that all together and have a full rollout campaign. Okay. Um, and so I didn't. I'm not probably probably spearheading that. I'll, you know, I'll chime in when necessary. Whoever sure. picks up the film for distribution, yeah, they'll probably have a huge say in that. They will have a huge say in that. Um, but you know, I, I mean, I know that, you know what we have, so I'm gonna help out and you know chime in where necessary. Of course. Yeah. And is it? Um, uh, you know, obviously Netflix and, and streaming videos sort of changed the game, I think, where, you know, probably not too long ago, if something wasn't in theaters, it sort of wasn't official. Um, is that something you guys think about, like, just streaming versus theatrical? Um, yeah, I mean, those offers are all, you know, on the table and everything. I, I'm not really too, I'm involved in all that. It's kind of the producer's. Thing, okay. But um, yeah. I mean, you know, we'd love to do everything. I would love to do everything personally, but sure. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I don't know. Yeah. They're handling all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. They just let me know what they decide. <laughs> are there other um, what's do you have a, what are some other like music documentaries that that, you know, are favorites of yours? Oh man, I love the uh, I love the Amy Winehouse documentary. Mm. Um. I loved. Uh, I really, really like the Amy Winehouse story. I like Tupac Resurrection was good. Um, it's not a music documentary, it's an entertainment documentary. I love The Legend of Shep Gordon, Superman. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's probably my favorite documentary. That's great. It's a great documentary. Yeah. Mike Myers did that one. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I love documentaries. <laughs> uh-huh. That's my thing, so. Yeah. Nice. Well, I have a little um, speed round that, that I want to go through before we wrap up. Um let me just make sure I get to all these right. Oh, what about favorite music video? Favorite music video? Yeah. Ooh. I love the uh, Sun Models Odessa video. Okay. By Ian Ponce Joel. I really like that one. I love... Uh, the I forgot the name of the video. It's by Gustafelstein. Okay. Um, it's like everyone knows that I forgot the name of it. That's a great one. Um, you know what? I really like the 24K Magic Bruno Mars video uh-huh. just because I thought the production value on it was incredible. I thought, you know, the way it was, the palette, everything about it was just so, the choreography was amazing. Sure. That's another one I really liked. Do you like that song? I don't, you know, I don't mind it. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a it's a poppy, cool song. Yeah. But, I mean, those are probably, like, three videos that just come to the top of my head. Yeah, yeah, should be No, I, I was more, I asked that more curious, like, uh, does it matter if you like a song? Like, can you like a video and not like the song that goes? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and I think, you know, you can like a video that makes you then like a song. Sure. That's happened all the of course. time. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, cool. So uh, if you can go back, well, we're not going back very far, but um, say to your, to your 18-year-old self or before you started in this, on this path and give one piece of advice to yourself, what would you say? Uh, start earlier. <laughs> yeah? Start right now. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's... That's good. Um, is there something that you used to believe and and then later you decided you'd been wrong? Um, 
Yeah, I, you know, I used to believe that, like, you know, making a film is, like, this so this super far-fetched, out-of-this-world idea that, like, you know, you need to do this and that, and it's just, like, years to do, and the contract phase takes, like, a year, and then it falls through, and it's just, yeah. da, 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 but it's really not. Like, honestly, you meet the right producers, you got, a, you got a good story, you got your vision straight, and you're driven, it'll happen. So that's a big myth. Was there, so given that, was there moments where you felt like, I, you know, I can't do this? Like, like how could I possibly... No, I, I don't. I don't think so. It's just more. In it, yeah, it was just more so one of those things where it's like this is gonna take forever, yeah. and I, you know, I hope it works out and it doesn't fall through and I have to start all over again. I knew it was gonna happen eventually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's just a matter of like when it fully just goes in one big wave. That's cool. What talent have you always wished you had more of? Music. I wish I could. I wish I could do music. What would, what would you do? If I could do music, I don't know, man. I I, I probably would be a producer. Okay. Um. Or like a, a drummer. Oh yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't want to sing or rap. Yeah. I don't think I have the street credibility for that. <laughs> I don't know, man. The, the the bar keeps changing for that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, well, this might you might have already answered this, but <clears throat> if you could choose another career and know that you wouldn't fail, what what would it be? Oh, I'd probably play professional soccer. Okay. For sure. Nice. Or music. Damn. <laughs> yeah, those are good choices. Yeah. Um, who you, who would you play for? Uh, probably like uh, somewhere in England. Yeah, Premier League. Probably Premier League. Yeah, definitely. Favorite team? Chelsea. Okay, nice. They're friends of ours. <laughs> um, so who would you be most excited to learn was a fan of of your work? Um. You know, probably like a Quentin Tarantino would be would be incredible. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he's a huge G Funk fan. I can't imagine he is. He probably not. <laughs> but uh, I oh, know you got to do a screening for him and RZA. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I know they're actually they're working together. Yeah, yeah, they they, they do a lot together. Um, yeah. maybe yeah, damn, maybe he is. I don't know. Okay. That'll be that'll be cool. I think yeah. that'll be really cool. If, you know. For sure. He's incredible. So I know you said you like to travel. What um, what's your favorite city to travel to? My favorite city to travel to, I would say. You know what? After coming back from Austin, I love Austin, <laughs> but I would say it's you know L London's awesome. I love uh, I love New York. I love. Um, Costa Rica, not a city, but Costa Rica is an incredible place. Yeah. An adventure and all that and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. There's a bunch. Those are good ones. Yeah. I'm, I'm down. Um, do you collect anything? Do I collect anything? Uh, not really. No. No. Um, no. What's the last great book you read? Last great book, Steve Jobs' biography cool. uh, by Walter Isaacson. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Is there a book that that's had a, a big impact on your uh, on you as a filmmaker? That book for sure, hundred yeah. percent. Um, from a design standpoint, mm. the emphasis he put on design and attention to detail is something that you know I've kind of made a staple of what I do and focus point. You know, make nice. sure everything's clean and, and you know. The, I spent probably three days just picking the font for this film. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's one of the great thing about documentaries. Obviously, there's so many stories that need to be told, but I also think like um, people are just doing really cool things with design in those films, which you you kind of can't do in a in like a dramatic film, right? Because it's just a different thing. But but fonts and like you wouldn't think about a font in a comedy mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. um but yeah like like all that I, I think it was uh watching the am documentary um just the way like they transitioned between interviews and and all just all the graphics and stuff mm -hmm. i think that's cool stuff oh yeah i mean there's you you have to stylize your documentary and yeah. you know ours is not stylized to like an, an insane level uh, you know compared to like superman or something like that sure. but you know you do have to have like a, a design and style in mind when you when you approach it. Yeah. You know. 
What movie do you think you've seen the most in your life? What movie I've seen the most in my life? Man. Uh. I don't know. I, I try not to. Wa- Honestly, I try not to watch a movie more than like twice. Oh, wow. Three times. That's impressive. Yeah, it's weird. Um, I just like. And, and I'll I'll watch it once and I'll watch it again to look at, you know, certain things like, or for enter or I'll watch it once and just hyper analyze and I'll watch it once for entertainment and then, yeah. you know, after that it's like if I keep watching it, I, <laughs> I can't. Even as a kid. As a kid, I mean, I I watch like cartoons. Yeah, yeah, sure. And whatnot. Uh, I've seen Munich a bunch. Oh wow. Um, kind of That's random. great. I've seen Cash If You Can. I've okay. Seen, um. Everyone's seen Home Alone like a thousand times. Totally. So that, if you were to actually go numerically, I'd probably seen Home Alone a million times. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that question because it's never like our. It's never the best movie. Oh yeah, it's, you it's, know it's what I mean. It's always Christmas movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because just on all the time. Yeah. That's hilarious. Um, what about favorite DJ? Favorite DJ. Um. Favorite DJ. Like electronic DJ, yeah, like any, anybody you've seen live. Um, I'm just gonna say artists because I don't really okay listen to them. I mean Anderson Pack. Right yeah, now. love him. He's probably my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> he's, you've he's, seen him live. I haven't seen him live, oh, but I, I've met him. I was yeah. at Coachella last yeah, yeah. year, and he was uh, hanging out with Dre, and I was standing next to him, and I didn't I didn't know it was Anderson Pack at that time because like back then, last Coachella, he wasn't huge yet. Right. I think it was just coming off South by, and yeah. uh, he's saying, like, can I get a Corona? And I was like, yeah, for sure, man. And after the fact, my buddy's like, dude, that's Anderson Pack. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> man, I, t- I took, like, six people to uh, to see him at Coachella. Yeah. I mean, I didn't take them to Coachella, but, like, we went over to the tent, to, and they were, like, house music fans that had never heard of him. He's amazing. And then they're all, like, Anderson Pack fans now. You can't not like him. He's, yeah. like, the blend of soulful, you know, with today. It's yeah. Like, no, it's he's, incredible. He's amazing. Yeah. Well, good stuff, man. Dude, thank you for yeah. making time for this interview. I appreciate it. Can't wait to see the film. I'm, I'm bummed mm-hmm. that I missed it in Austin, but uh, we'll definitely be looking for it. Um, so how do people, how are people going to find you or the or the film online? Um, well, you can find me, uh, contact, I mean, that's my email, but I don't, I don't know. You can just go yeah, to my Are you website. on social? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. Okay. Uh, Carmgill underscore, uh, on Twitter, Carmgill underscore. Okay. Um, you can find the film, um, you know, in the next little while, we'll have a, a distribution deal announced at some nice. point. And then uh, we'll be at the Nashville Film Festival, Nashville Film Music Festival coming up. And then we'll have our, you know, Canadian premiere coming up as well in April. Dope. And then I think there's a few more festivals. I got to check the calendar. Okay, cool. But uh, yeah, we'll be around. Yeah. So people will definitely be able to see it soon. Nice. This year for sure. Can't wait. I'm excited. Mm-hmm. Thank you, man. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. All right, that's a wrap with Karam Gill. Make sure you look for the G-Funk documentary coming soon to a screen near you. And um, make sure you check out Rebel Radio next week. Peace.